So uh, my name is Gabriel Ryan. I'm a security engineer at. Let me just adjust this. Okay, in the back. Can you hear me? Okay, good stuff. My name is Gabriel Ryan. I'm a security engineer at Gotham Digital Science, um, also known as Solstice. Uh, uh, we primarily do like AppSec, infrastructure testing, red teaming, research, etc. Uh, so new things in this presentation. Uh, we're going to be talking about hostile portal attacks. That's a method of stealing Active Directory credentials from uh, WPA2 EAP networks without network access. And we're also going to be talking about indirect wireless pivots, uh, which is a way of using rogue IP attacks to bypass the uh, port based access control mechanism by controlling the physical layer of the network. Uh, so, before we move on into that stuff, a little background info. Uh, we're going to talk about WPA2 EAP and the vulnerabilities that affect them. Um, so, historically, uh, WPA2 EAP, at least the weaker forms of it, have been susceptible to evil twin attacks or rogue access points in general, actually. So, rogue IP attacks, uh, you can consider them the bread and butter of the modern wireless pen test. Uh, you can use them for stealthy man in the middle attacks, uh, stealing radius credentials, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. And the way that they work, I mean, the, the simplest form of rogue IP attack is the evil twin attack. The way that it works is that you have an access point um, like the one that we see here, and then you ha have a bunch of clients to it. So, let's say that these four clients are connected to DEF CON open on channel six. Um, so if an attacker creates uh, an identical access point to this one, uh, but with a, with a stronger signal strength, so uh, stronger signal strength but also has DEF CON open channel 6, uh, what will happen is this will cause the clients to drop their associations to the, to the, to the valid access point and then connect to uh, the rogue access point, which you see down here. And at this point, the attacker has a man in the middle that, that, that he or she can use uh, to do all kinds of crazy stuff like well, almost dropped the shot glass. Um, <laughs> like stealing creds and and the attacks that we're going to see today. So I mean, these these are these are not new attacks. They've been around for a really long time. Um, you know, in fact, uh, the first the first mention I could find of them was in 2002 in uh, this this wireless the wireless land security fact uh, by C W Klaus talks about evil twin attacks. Uh, fast forward a bit, you have 2003 of ASLEEP by Joshua Wright. 2004, we start seeing karma attacks. We're not going to really go in into those today, but um, if you don't know what they are, check them out. They're pretty cool. That was Dino Diazovi and Shay McCauley. You know, in 2008, you have Josh Wright and Brandon Tonowitz um, uh, comes out with uh, you know attacks. You know, this is where you start to see attacks against WPA2 EAP uh, using rogue AP attacks, and that's free radius WPE. 2014, uh, by that point, karma attacks had stopped working as well. So two researchers, uh, Dominic White and Ian De Villiers, uh, came up with uh, a, a, they essentially fixed karma and then also added a bunch of uh, cool techniques for adding, uh, attacking EAP, which, one of which we're going to talk about. And also in 2017, very, very recently, you have the guy who wrote Wi-Fi Fisher um, implemented the Lure 10 attack, which you can use against uh, Windows 10's Wi-Fi Sense. So um, what's common, the, the common theme here is that you know, rogue AP attacks have been primarily used to fill one of two roles, uh, stealing creds using man middle attacks or breaching WPA and WPA2 networks. Um, in this talk, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to talk about uh, using rogue AP attacks as a means of lateral movement. So uh, before we continue, we should probably talk about you know how you can use an evil twin attack against uh, WPA2 EAP, and you know to do that we have to understand how EAP or the extensible authentication protocol works. So logically, and for those of you who are familiar with EAP, I'm going to leave out the, that the, the authenticator for now, uh, just to make this. Um, it, just to you know, address this from like a high level perspective first. But logically, authentication in EAP um, occurs between the supplicant and the authentication server. So the supplicant is just a fancy way of saying the wireless client, and the authentication server is the radius server that's sitting you know in the background, uh, you know deeper in the network. So the first thing that happens is the client sends an authentication request to the authentication server. At that point, the authentication server responds with with an X509 certificate. And this X, the, the role of this X509 certificate is to verify the identity of the authentication server. And, and, and if the client you know, accepts the certificate, it's saying that it, it, it trusts the authentication server. And you know, from that point forward, uh, we move from the outer authentication, which is what we're seeing here, to this, this, what we're seeing at the bottom of this diagram here. And that's the, your inner authentication. The inner authentication occurs through a secure tunnel that's established at that point. Now, the reason why we need the secure tunnel is that, you know, because it's being used for, although this is being used as an authentication mechanism for WPA, that WPA does not actually kick in until this entire process is complete. So essentially, this is all happening over open Wi-Fi. So without that secure tunnel that's established, um, this authentication process can be sniffed. And in fact, legacy implementations of EAP were, were susceptible to, the, to this, specifically EAP MD5. Uh, so when I said there are two components to EAP authentication, actually that, that wasn't entirely accurate. Um, there's a third component involved as well, and that's the authenticator. The authenticator, um, at least when you're dealing with wireless, is the access point. And the job of the access point in, in this case is to um, act as an intermediary between the, the wireless client and the authentication server. Uh, typically there's like a wired connection between the access point and the authentication server, and then all the communication there is happening over layer 7, radius. And then on layer 2, we have the supplicant and the, um, the AP, and that's communicating over wireless. 
So at this point, you know, in order for this this uh, uh, this communication to, in order for this to work, two things have to happen uh, for this to be secure. You know, the client has to be able to trust the authentication server, and the client also has to be able to trust um, uh, the access point. And you know, as, as we mentioned, this is all happening over over open Wi-Fi, and as, as we also mentioned earlier, open Wi-Fi networks are susceptible to evil twin attacks. So likewise, this whole process um, can actually be middled using an evil twin attack. You know, what, what you do is you create a rogue access point attack or a rogue access point, and, that, and you force the client to connect to you. And at that point, you run your own radius server in the background. And so long as the client accepts your forged certificate, your X509 certificate, and, and, and by doing that is saying that it trusts you, at that point, it will establish a secure tunnel with you. And then you can, it'll, it'll perform the authentication process with you. And that allows you to uh, crack the EAP challenge or response offline, uh, giving you credentials. So this attack, uh, first talked about by Brad and Tony Woods in 2008, as well as uh, Josh Wright in their uh, ShmooCon presentation. And, uh, it's been around for a while. So for, for the new stuff, we're going to do live demos, but just for the sake of time and also not pissing off the demo gods, if it's just like review stuff, I'm just going to stick to videos. Because um, it's also because it's Sunday, but whatever. So in the first stage of this attack, uh, what's going to happen, what you're seeing here is the attacker is actually creating a, 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 a forged certificate, a self-signed certificate. And that's what's going to be sent to the client. Fast forward a bit. And you know the, the attacker is starting the AP. As you see here, uh, the AP is enabled. And what's going to happen shortly is that you're going to get a client associating. See that the client is now associating with the with the access point. And shortly thereafter, you should see right there we have the username, challenge, and response. So at this point, you have the username, challenge, and response. And you can at this point you crack it to obtain either the plain text credentials or um, the NT hash, which is uh, equivalent to the plain text credentials in terms of what you can use it for. So there are two ways of doing this. The, the oldest way of doing it is with a dictionary attack. And the success rate of this is inversely proportional to the strength of the password. So if you have a really strong password, it's going to be, it's, it's actually like a, a pretty bad attack. Um, you know, in, in 2012, uh, Moxie Mar Marlon Swake and David Holton, uh, you know, they, they actually uh, uh, did a talk where they, they did the, um, at, at DEF CON where they did a divide and conquer attack. So MS Chat V2, which is, which is uh, the, the um, inner authentication protocol used by EAP Peep, um, actually uses the same 56 DES encryption as NTL MV1. So the security of this protocol is actually reducible to the strength of a single DES encryption. So instead of, you know, um, with a dictionary attack, we're, we're trying to recover a plain text password. For this, you tr attempt to recover an NT hash, and it actually, with a, with a, um, a, a powerful FPGA-based cracking rig, such as crack.sh, um, which you can go look that up, it's pretty cool, um, which was pr previously Cloudcracker, you can actually achieve a 1% success rate in less than 24 hours for recovering that NT hash. So as you can see, it, it, it's, it's pretty vulnerable. So the solution that was introduced to kind of mitigate this issue was EAPTLS. And this was introduced in 2008, um, probably in response to uh, the attacks that came out around the same time period. And, and the, the cool thing about EAPTLS is that it uses mutual authentication using X509 certificates right off the bat. So the strength lies in, in the use of these client-side certificates uh, because you know, with those, you can't really do the evil twin attacks that we, that we, that we showed you in the beginning. Um, unfortunately, how many network admins are out there right now? Let's throw of hands. All right. So, how many, how many, how many people out there, you know, think that, that putting a client side, a client cert on every device on your network is like a good time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, th this is why it never really took off because it's, it's like, oh yeah, just put, just put a, a cert on everything, and, and it's actually not that simple. And you know, it's, and it's even more difficult if you have like existing network infrastructure to integrate this stuff into, or if you're in, in like a, a special scenario, like you know, you're dealing with, you know, industrial control systems or, or medical equipment or something like that uh, that might not even support client, um, client-based certificates. So, you know, you run into this classic security versus convenience scenario. And you know this this kind of you know network administrators are, are forced to choose between uh, uh, two really kind of like poor choices you know the authentication mechanisms with known weaknesses or you can use EAPTLS which is highly secure but it's also very um, very impractical. So what this does is it actually creates a market gap and you know there, there are all kinds of products that have tried to address this over the years uh, and, and try to compensate for the security issues found in EAPP and EAPTTLS but are also kind of easy to use. So the current trend that, 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 you know, ten, that we tend to see over and over and over again um, is, is a focus on breach containment rather than breach prevention. So the idea is you acknowledge that, um, yes, the wireless, imp the, the wireless perimeter is, is weak, um, but you, you try to you know, stop the, the threat once it gets in that inner layer, of, uh, that, that first layer of defense. So what we're going to talk about in this uh, today is whether or not this actually works. So um, I, I guess the, the most common way of approaching this containment problem is using a, a network access control mechanism uh, to attempt to stop threats uh, as, as they occur. So before that, I'm going to present you with this, this awesome little cartoon. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
So yeah, the most common way uh, that this is usually implemented is, is to use a NAC to, to um, you know, once, once an attacker gets on the network, uh, you identify them as an untrusted endpoint and you quarantine them. You either, you know, completely block the port or you, you place them in a, a quarantine VLAN. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, there are two varieties of NAC out there. There's an agent-based NAC and an agentless NAC. And agent-based NACs, you know, what that involves is a software component installed on, on, on every authorized endpoint on the network. And, these, these, uh, and, and this software component is called an agent. And this agent communicates with the brain of the NAC, and, 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 and that's how the brain of the NAC distinguishes so it will tell that a particular endpoint is, is allowed to be there. And this is, this is highly effective, but once again, you have something you have to put on every authorized endpoint, so it's nearly as impractical as EAP TLS. So then on the other side of the spectrum, you have, you have agentless NACs. And uh, agentless NACs, they use, uh, they're purely external. Uh, they use passive fingerprint printing, active scanning, and they're much easier to deploy than agent-based NACs. Uh, but unfortunately, they're also unable to examine the internals of the network components, so you can bypass them simply by masquerading as a valid uh, host on the network. So once again, you know, we, even by using a NAC, we run into you know, the same recurring dilemma, which is you know, insecurity versus impracticality. So this creates yet another market gap, you know, where you have a high demand for a solution that offers the deep interrogation capabilities of an agent-based NAC, but without the additional overhead. So, you know, there's a third category. There are all kinds of uh, really interesting solutions that have, that have once again tried to, tried to bridge this gap, uh, and, and we, we usually refer to those as next-generation uh, NACs. You have um, kind of like AI-based solutions that kind of, you know, establish a baseline on the network and try to figure out, look for anomalies. Uh, you have, um, we're going to talk about one in particular just because it's a, a pretty good example of an a, a, a interesting attempt at doing this. Um, I tried to borrow this particular network appliance uh, from, from my IT department. I opened up a help desk ticket. It's a $10,000 piece of equipment, though, and uh, yeah, I, I could have seen that coming, right? But interesting enough, I also got like a warning from legal not to name drop these people, so we're going to refer to this as vendor A. Um, but you know, this, this one really interesting uh, piece of equipment, it uses WMI to interrogate new devices. And uh, you know, this is really cool because it's capable of performing internal checks without using an agent. Um, with that said, I mean, the way it does this is it authenticates over SMB using a single administrative service account. The service account, you know, it's, it's given remote login privileges to all authorized devices at the group policy level, um, and, and, the, and, and this allows it to perform deep interrogations without using an agent. Pretty cool, except that it also provides a single point of failure where you have this device that's sending God mode hashes to every new device that's added to the network. So, you know, um, you know, it, what, what, this, what happens here is we end up in a situation where the, the, the first potential threat here is to introduce the risk of SMB relay attacks. Um, in, in case you're unfamiliar, NTLM is a, a simple authentication protocol. Um, the way that it works is that you know, the client first attempts to authenticate with, with the server. The server issues a plain text uh, string of characters as a challenge to the client. The client then has to encrypt that string of characters using his password hash and then send the encrypted hash back to the server as a response. The server then decrypts it and compares it with the original string that it sent, and if they're the same, the authentication attempt succeeds. So with an SMB relay attack, you literally just put yourself in the middle of that process um, using a man-in-the-middle attack. The victim sends you the, the, the authentication request. You forward that to the target. Uh, the target then sends you the plain text string, the challenge. You forward that to the victim, and oops, and you keep forwarding stuff back and forth until what ends up happening is you're, you end up authenticated with the target instead of the victim. So, you know, once again, we have the, we have the system, but, you know, we, we've introduced the risk of SMB relay attacks um, because, you know, it, it's sending you NTLM hashes and trying to authenticate with you over NTLM. Um, but at the same time, uh, you, you could mitigate this potentially by using uh, um, SMB signing, which, 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 interestingly enough, it's actually disabled by default on everything but the domain controller um, in, in, in Windows. So, um, and the reason for this is the domain controller uh, downloads group policy over SMB. Um, but even if you enable SMB signing, which is it's what you do with SMB signing is you digitally sign packets uh, to confirm their authenticity. Um, even if you enable SMB signing, you still have uh, the issue of hashes being sent directly to untrusted endpoints. So um, interestingly enough, there is like a, a piece of software that you can put on every single network endpoint uh, that's provided by this vendor. But uh, essentially, then you're back to using an agent again, so you're kind of back to square one. So, I mean, I, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, no matter how it's thought into this, I mean, there, there's really no magic bullet here. I mean, you're, you're, you have this security with convenience um, uh, statement, but the problem is security with convenience is actually a paradox. So, back to wireless. Um, another, another technology that, that's often used as a, as a wireless security mechanism that's, that's worth looking at is, is, is client isolation. So the way that, um, the, the way, what client isolation is supposed to do, it's supposed to prevent wireless clients from, from talking to one another on the network. And you know, a typical use case is an open network. If you go on your hotel Wi-Fi, you may notice you cannot ping one another. That's because they probably have client isolation um, enabled. 
And you know, the way that um, 802.11 is supposed to work in theory is that the AP um, mediates all communication between the, the, the clients. So if this guy here wants to send a package to this guy over here, the client can just stop it and, and say, no, you can't do that. Um, the problem is that client isolation, is, at least on a, a wireless network, is a logical control. It's not a physical control. So you know, the problem is, how do you prevent radio transceivers from communicating with one another? So a really awesome researcher who unfortunately is no longer with us, named Cedric Blancher, uh, back in 2005, his response to this was, you can't. And he released a tool called uh, Wi-Fi Tap. Uh, and, and this was later revived in, in 2013 by Oliver Lavery of Gotham Digital Science, way before my time. Um, but the way Wi-Fi Tap is it reads packets from the victim to the AP using a, a Wi-Fi interface in, in monitor mode. And then you know, every time it receives one of those packets, it's going out to the distribution system, it injects a response as if it's coming from the AP. So this allows it to actually um, uh, communicate with the, um, with the various devices on the network without actually being associated with the network at all. And it provides a, a neat little ton tap device that you can use to, to, to bridge over to the, uh, uh, to, to the monitor mode interface to do this. So, I mean, there are some later tools that, that let you do even more stuff. The Aircrack Suite has AirTonNG, which you can do this with WEP. And there's also TKIPTONNG, which you can do this with WPA1. Um, there's also this, this uh, theoretical attack that uh, has been talked about called Hole 196, where uh, I, I, I guess the idea is that you, could you might be able to do this with WPA2. It's really, really, really debatable whether this actually works. I've never seen it pulled off before, uh, but it's worth mentioning just to be thorough. So uh, here's an example of, 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 of Wi-Fi tap doing its thing. In the top right, uh, we have a, we're going to create a, a, a valid, a, an open access point. And then we're going to connect to this open access point from our host operating system. This, this terminal is, is SSH into a VM, by the way. And then we're going to start send, sending, um, send, sending ICMP packets uh, to, this, to this AP. And what you're going to notice is we're going to have five ICMP packets sent. And there are going to be five responses. So now what we're going to do is we're going to, in, in this uh, terminal to the left, we're going to start up Wi-Fi ping. And Wi-Fi ping is a modified version of Wi-Fi tap that um, essentially all it does is every time it sees an ICMP packet and, and sniffs one, it injects a response to that ICMP packet in the, in the form of an ICMP reply. So we're going to run that as well and repeat the, what we did in the last process, uh, sending five ICMP packets. And notice now that instead of receiving five ICMP replies, we receive 10 of them. And we also get little warnings that we're receiving duplicates. So what we've just done is we've sent packets to um, a, a, a network endpoint without actually being associated with that network. So, you know, food for thought. You know, going back to the whole issue of NAC, right? You know, what if we're missing the point? You know, what we've been talking to up until this point is, is whether or not, um, you know, NACs are able of, 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 of stopping a direct attack. But, you know, when we're talking about wireless, NAC is the only problem. Um, you know, the role of NAC is to prevent attackers from accessing sensitive resources after the breach has occurred. Um, you know, and, and they do this by, by when an authorized endpoint is detected, uh, they take one of two actions. Either the endpoint is placed in quarantine or the port is blocked. But you know, violating access control po policies, uh, what this does is it causes the NAC to impose a restriction. And in a wired network, this is a physical restriction, but in a wireless network, this can only be a logical restriction. More on this later. So I want you to think of a scenario that, that, that's pretty common in, 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 you know, if you're doing pen testing or, or anything that's, that's dealing with this kind of uh, infrastructure testing. So, um, you know, we've already breached the perimeter using the attack that we, we described in the first section of, the, of, of this talk. And this is us, we're over on the left, we're on this, we've been quarantined, and we want to get over here, we want to pivot further into the network where we, actually, we can actually do some damage. Uh, unfortunately, we've been quarantined by this NAC here, uh, but fortunately for us, there's this victim over here that we could potentially do something with, and, and, and also as a wireless client. So, more on that later. Um, but the question is, how do we get out of this situation? So, I mean, to understand this, um, we need to look at something called LMNR and MTNS poisoning. Um, and, and LMNR and MTNS poisoning, it, it, it basically takes advantage of a flaw with a net, uh, that exists within NetBIOS name resolution. Um, so the way NetBIOS name resolution works is that uh, the first thing that will happen is that a Windows host, when it's trying to resolve a NetBIOS name, it'll check um, internally its local cache and also its LM host file. If that fails, um, it will then attempt to attempt DNS resolution using local name servers. Um, at that point, um, if, if that fails as well, it will fall back to LMNR and MBTNS um, and, and send broadcast requests to the entire subnet. So uh, LMNR and MBTNS, they're actually different mechanisms, but they serve the same logical functionality. And this is best understood through example. Let's say we have two computers named Alice and Leroy. Alice wants to request a file from Leroy, but doesn't know Leroy's IP. All that Alice knows is, is Leroy's NetBIOS name. So Alice will attempt to resolve Leroy's name locally and, using D, uh, locally and also using local DNS. But let's say this attempt fails. Alice will then make a broadcast request using LMNR and MBTNS. At this point, every single computer on Alice's subnet will receive this request. And the idea here is that only Leroy should respond to this. But this is based on, on, on our system. Does anyone see a problem with this yet? 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot like ARC, where, you know, there's no honor among thieves. If Alice receives two of these responses, only the first one's going to be considered valid, and this is going to create a race condition. The attacker can simply wait for LMNR and BTNS queries and respond to all of them. And this will cause uh, the victims of this attack to send their traffic to the attacker. So there's a, the, the most, I guess, like, the most popular tool for doing this, and really the pioneer in doing this was um, a responder by Lawrence Jaffe, or, or Lawrence Jaffe, should I say. And we're going we're gonna to start this up on the left, and... We're going to run this, and you can see here that we're poisoning element R and BTNS, and we also have auth servers that are waiting for us when this thing tries to connect to us and authenticate. So we're running responder, and then what we're going to do over here on the right, we have a victim computer uh, named Jenkins. We attacked Leroy earlier. Um, and <laughs> so Jenkins is going to try to connect to, um, is going to, try to, connect to, to a non-existent uh, file server. And the reason why we're using a host name that isn't valid is because it will force Jenkins to fall back to element R MBTNS because it obviously won't be resolvable using the first three methods. And then when this happens, um, the responder tool that we're running on, on the left is going to poison those, uh, send poison answers to Jenkins, and oh, we have the user's hash right there. So we're about 5% uh, you know, finished with our escape attempt. Uh, I'm just going to check the time really fast. Okay, we're doing great. Awesome. So um, the next thing we need to go over to, in order to understand how we can get out of this is something called redirect SMB. Now, the idea behind redirect SMB is that you force the victim to visit an HTTP endpoint that redirects to an SMB share on the attacker's machine. So you send them a URL, they click the URL, and this takes them to a specially configured HTTP server, and the only thing this HTTP server does is one thing and one thing only, and it redirects all HTTP requests to a rogue SMB server that's sitting there um, waiting to accept um, uh, NTLM authentication. And what this does is it causes the victim's browser to attempt NTLM authentication with the attacker. Uh, there's a variation of this uh, called, you know, where, where you simply redirect to a non-existent SMB share, and this triggers element R and MBTNS. But it's a really fast way to get hashes. It does require social engineering, though, or some way of getting them to access that, that, that server. So um, now's where we get into new stuff. It looks like we have lots of time to go over it, too, so demo guys will probably be somewhat happy about this. Um, so now we're going to talk about hostile portal attack. So the hostile portal attack, it's a way of stealing active direct directory credentials from a wireless network without direct network access. And the way that you do this is, is you essentially make a modified captive portal. So a captive portal, how many of you have seen something like this recently? Yeah, yeah. so if you're staying in a hotel, you run into this, it's a captive portal, and the idea here is that you restrict Wi-Fi access by um, forcing users to, to visit this page first, and you know at that point you can do anything you want. It's most commonly used to... Uh, uh, you, you either prompt them to authenticate or, or, or provide credit card information or something like that. So the way this works is that um, all DNS queries are resolved to the captive portal. You know, and, and, and this is usually specified using a DHCP option, but also, um, you know, in case that they're manually setting their, the, the victim is manually setting their, their DNS server, uh, you can also redirect DNS traffic to your own DNS server so that they're forced to use yours. And then if you really want to be nasty, you just redirect HTTP traffic to, to your uh, captive portal as well, so that even if they're not using DNS um, at all, uh, you, you still have them trapped. Uh, so what a hostile portal attack is that you kind of modify this so that it performs a redirect to SMB attack. Uh, the victim's forced to connect to the attacker using rogue AP attack, kind of like that, right? And the next thing that happens is that you, instead of redirecting everything to a captive portal, you perform a redirect to SMB. And, and what happens is that the victim is then forced to, um, if, if, they're, if they're using HTTP traffic at all, they'll be forced to authenticate with the attacker, and that gives you NCLM creds. So, um, and, and, and in the background also, to make this more effective, uh, we can run uh, Responder to poison element R and MBTNS uh, requests, so that even if they're just kind of idle, we can still get them that way. So now, now we're going to do a live demo. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to switch screens here. All right, so in the bottom left here, we're going to create, um, we're going to do this on the open access point first because there's a, another couple steps that we have to do to get this to work with a, um, a not so open access point, uh, a WPA2 EAP access point. Oh, it's not on the screen. Uh oh. All right, do you see one thing now? All right, I'm just going to, still not on the screen. Oh, uh, whatever. Okay, I'm going to just use the video then, because uh, unless I can, well, I have 35 minutes. Here, check this out. Command F1. I, do I have a command button? Uh, this is a Mac, so I'm not sure. All right, can you, can you see stuff now? All right, cool. Nothing like system preferences to the, to the rescue. Thanks, Steve Jobs. Um, 
Yeah, so, so if your Mac breaks, you just you just pray to Steve Jobs, and then everything works again. Except now my stuff's on two different desktops because I try to fix it that way. All right, back to the first desktop. And I'm going to put a two-minute curfew on this demo, demo, or a one-minute curfew on this demo, should I say? Yeah, I'll give it two. And if, it, if, I, if, I, if I encounter two minutes worth of problems, just so we can squeeze everything in, I'm going to just move on. But hopefully, the way things are going, uh, you know, knock on wood, yeah, this should this should work. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a. Oh, these are backwards. I move this here. Okay. So we, we've created the open access point. This does not look like an open access point. All right, so so we tried to create an open access point. Now we're 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 uh, we're killing the peep. Okay. All right, here we go. So we're going to create an open access point uh, using EPAMR. We're actually going to use the same attack tool that we used for attacking this thing to create our valid access point. Because uh, why not? And then we're going to have Leroy up here in the in, in the top left. Um, can you guys see this? Okay, good stuff. And okay, it looks like we're already connected. Excellent. Uh, we're now going to create our rogue access point over here. Uh, and this, we're going to launch this attack. And then we're going to get ready to de authenticate uh, Leroy to get it to roam from one BSSID to another, which will make this attack effective with all these network interfaces really close together. So we're doing this. And okay, so we've gotten it to associate. And notice that when we open up IE, okay, now we have hashes. Now I have to get everything now I have to get everything to stop. Okay. There we go. Cool stuff. So that, that's a hostile portal attack against a open network. It's somewhat impressive. We're gonna make it a little more impressive. We're gonna use it against WPA2 in a second once I clear this uh, previous hash that we just captured, so we can do it twice. Oh really? Okay. I feel like we've been here before for some reason. Okay. Magic. Okay, so uh, okay, so now let's talk about how to do this with WPA EAP networks. So in most cases, uh, WPA EAP means EAP TTLS or EAP PEEP. Both of these use MS Chat V2 as the inter-authentication protocol. Interesting thing about MS Chat V2, it uses mutual authentication, which means that at the very end of the authentication uh, process, the radio servers must actually do prove a knowledge of the, of, the, of the user's password to the client uh, for the entire authentication process to succeed. So what this means is that although the attacker can force the victim to authenticate with an evil, um, evil twin uh, to steal the hashes, uh, the, the radio server will still fail the final stage of the authentication process and the client will not associate with the attacker. So the way that you get around this, because you do need to, in order to do the hostile portal attack, you do need, do need to get it to completely associate with you, there are a couple options. So for, for weak radius passwords, uh, you can use a technique uh, that uh, Don White and even developers came out with in, in DEF CON 22 called autocrack and add, and we'll talk about that in a second. And the second solution that we can use um, is simply to crack, crack, crack them offline and finish the attack later. Um, so uh, the, the way that, the, at the very end of the um, MS Chat V2 authentication process, uh, the, the victim here is going to send a challenge response, which is part of what we're cracking um, offline to obtain the credentials, uh, to uh, the, the radio server, which in this case, uh, with, the, with the tools that we're using for the attack, is host APD. Um, at that point, uh, host APD is going to load uh, the password from this file called the EAP user file, which is just like a, a, specially, uh, it's like a special text file that's used as a database that contains that information. So, you know, at that point, um, the, 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 the attacker, or the, the radio server in this case, is going to attempt uh, to construct the, an authentication response that proves knowledge of the user's password, and then that will be sent with the auth, auth success message back to the victim. So when, you're, when you use an autocrack and add technique, uh, what you're doing is instead of um, immediately loading that password from the EAP user file, uh, you, you, you instead take the challenge response and send it to a cracking rig. And this can be like a remote cracking rig that's very powerful. It doesn't have to be something that's on your laptop. And then you, you, you send that off, and then you know the idea is that hopefully uh, you'll get the, the results of that back in time where you can actually just append it to the end of that user file in real time and then use that to construct the authentication response. You know, th this may not work the first time, but you know, the idea is that maybe in, like, in a few seconds or even a few minutes when the, the victim tries to reassociate, um, that, that this will work and the, the full association will, will, will happen. Um, 
And the, the second option, of course, uh, for, for all those other passwords, uh, is simply to crack offline and, and, and finish it later. Um, you know, without even going into the discussion that you know, advanced persistence threats, like this guy over on the right, um, you know, aren't really limited by time boxing. Uh, remember that we talked about how the divide and conquer technique uh, with, with, with sufficiently powerful hardware uh, can crack MS Chaffee 2 uh, within 24 hours with a 100% success rate. So you can just, you can just go with that and just, you know, do the cracking and then, then uh, come back the next day and do it. So for, for demo purposes, I'm obviously not going to connect to the DEF CON Wi-Fi and, and, and send stuff over there, so we're going to go with the first option. All right, so here we are. This is a uh, very similar. Can you guys see the? Uh, okay, yeah, I can see that. So that, that's working. So we're going to first create a PEEP access point this time using WPA2 PEAP. And this this uh, wireless client here, Leroy, is going to attempt to connect to it. And it did. Okay, so we have the, the connection. Now we're going to start our rogue. And actually, before I do that, I'm going to go in here. And actually, because I, I did this earlier to practice, and the credentials are already there, so I'm going to get rid of them. Okay. And we're going to do a local autocrack, so we're just going to do this internally. And finally, to get this thing to roam, deauth as before. Hopefully, this works. Uh oh. All right. So what are we running here? No. Okay. Maybe I'm deauthing the wrong thing. That would be bad. Or no, well, it's still connected to that. So okay. Uh, authenticated. I'm actually just going to copy. I'm going to copy uh, and paste this uh, this MAC address from from here and see if I can see if I can try it again. All right, try number two. Oh, you know what this is? Do you see how I'm clicking this, uh, this thing right here um, over and over again? It's not bringing up the network manager. That's because I'm using a virtual machine, and the virtual interface has, has cooked itself and is not doing a thing. But luckily, I came prepared because uh, th I seem to be on the, the demo god's bad side recently. So. We'll just we'll just go with that route. Okay, so back to where we were. Um, in the top right, uh, we have the, the legitimate access point, and we're going to create a Wi-Fi network called uh, Example Wi-Fi. It's going to be a PEEP network. And in the bottom right, we're going to have Jenkins this time, and Jenkins is going to attempt to uh, 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 authenticate with this. And this is the valid access point, so we're just going to go ahead and connect them. And then the left hand side of the screen here, uh, this is where our, we're going to launch the rogue access point attack. So we're going to create that. We've created the rogue AP and started it. And then on, in, in this tab right here, uh, we're going to perform the deauth attack to get it to roam over to us. Uh, sometimes what happens with, oh wait, that, yeah. So sometimes what happens here, right, is that when certain clients, uh, they'll actually just you know pop off uh, the network completely. But then when they try to reassociate, they'll end up on the rogue AP. So a little user inconvenience there, but we don't really care about them anyways. Uh, so we see here that we've captured the credentials. Uh, they, they've been written to the end of the. Um, they've now been written to the end of the uh, EAP user file. Uh, so we're going to just cap the contents of that file really fast. Here we go. You see the end, they've been added. So now we're going to repeat the attack. And notice that when we do that, we go ahead and accept that, that, that cert warning that's popping up. So now we do that. Um, interesting thing, sometimes for some reasons when you connect to a network, uh, you, you, IE just manages to open itself uh, by itself. And of course when that happens, you're going to send HTTP traffic and you get hashes. And also check, check this out. This is going to be pretty cool. Um, every time you type in a character in the IE address bar, it tries to do a Bing search. So we're doing this and it's making HTTP requests. So every time you're typing in a character, we're just getting that hash over and over and over again. In fact, it looks like the EPAM over here is trying to complain that we're doing it so often. Um, and then over, also IE is like, like, what's going on? We can't request anything. So yeah, that's a hostile portal attack against WPA2 EAP. 
And what this gets you is lots and lots of NTLM hashes. You get similar results to LMNR and MBTNS poisoning, uh, but there are a few key advantages here. Uh, no direct network access required, and you're not limited to a local subnet. You get everything that's connected to wireless. And it's also not a passive attack. You're not waiting for LMNR to show up on, the subnet, uh, on your local subnet. Uh, you're actually forcing things to happen. So back to our scenario. Here we are. Um, we're going we're to do a new technique that, that builds off of the hostile portal attack. And it's a technique for using rogue IP attacks to bypass port-based access control mechanisms. Um, so here we are with the attacker. We're back on this quarantine VLAN. And we're actually going to do our escape attempt now. Once again, we've been quarantined here by the NAC. And um, over here we have the victim that's been placed on this restricted VLAN. You know, and, and, and obviously we want to get over here and access these sensitive resources. So what if we first, um, let's say that we have uh, one network adapter that's being used to access the, this VLAN. What if we first take a second network adapter and then force the, this victim to connect to that second network, network adapter using an evil twin attack? Well, at that point, the, the victim is, uh, you know, we, we take them off the restricted, uh, the network that we're attacking, and we force them to associate with us. We then attack them using a, a hostile portal attack to obtain their NTLM hashes. Crack the hashes offline, come back later, pick up where we left off. We might have to repeat the first step to make this work. But at that point, we can, we can place a time payload on the victim, right? Uh, like a scheduled task or something. At that point, we, we kill our, our, rogue AP, our rogue AP that's operating on our second network interface. We allow the victim to reassociate uh, with the target network. The NAC moves the victim back to the restricted VLAN because it's an authorized endpoint. At that point, we just wait for the reverse shell, and this could be the best NAC in the world, and it would not even matter. So um, that was cool, but it requires some offline cracking of NTLM. Uh, we obviously don't want to do that. Well, I mean, it, it'll work, but, but it'd be cooler if we could, we could speed that process up a bit. So to do this, we can use an SMB relay attack. Um, and we talked about those earlier. So with an SMB relay attack, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to first uh, use the rogue AP attack as before to force the victims to associate with our, with our hostile portal. And then when that happens, uh, we, we then initiate the hostile portal attack. But instead of just capturing uh, those, those NTLM hashes, we instead um, perform an SMB relay attack to obtain uh, a, a shell on one of these victims. And we, we use that shell to place a time, victim, uh, time payload on that victim. So that, that happens much more instantaneously. You don't have to, to crack those NTLM hashes offline. At this point, we, uh, we kill our rogue AP as before. This allows the victims to reassociate with the target network, wait for the reverse shell, and we bypass the NAC. And as I said, my USB interface is dead. So I have a backup. <laughs> so here, um, show of hands, how many people have used Empire before? All right, cool. For those of you who haven't, check it out. It's really easy to use, and it's, it's really, really fun. It actually has a module called Troll, troll Sploit, which you can use to, like, you know, just rickroll your, your, um, your victims or send a little prompts that say stuff like, you've been disconnected from the domain controller, just all kinds of funny stuff. So we're going to connect these, these, two, uh, these two VMs, these two victim VMs. We're going to use two of them this time uh, to our, our, uh, our legitimate access point over here in the bottom left. And on the right here, we're setting up uh, Empire to perform this attack. We're going to create two listeners. That's what our victims are going to connect back to. We've also created a, a payload. And this, this big blob of, of, of base 64 is a PowerShell command that's going to give us a reverse shell. And we're going to tell our SMB Relay uh, script, and we're using SMB Relay X, although you can use anything for this, really, um, to execute that on the target machine. We then launch the rogue AP attack. And as before, once the rogue AP is running, Use Air Replay to uh, uh, force these devices to associate with us by deauthenticating them, getting them to roam over to us. And you can see that happening here. All right. So we have one associated. We're going to have to force the other one to associate as well. So we're going to repeat that. And it's waiting for beacon frames, so I'm going to fast forward through that. So we've, um, we've, we've de-opted the second victim. The second victim is now going to roam over to us. And you can see that there's some that, that, that IE weirdness happening in the background when you first connect. Um, but, but now we're going to take that payload, and we're also going to grab the IP address of one of these victims and then feed it to our SMB relay script. So we're just going to copy and paste that over to our SMB relay script, which we've done here. And then we're going to start it. And at this point, we're going to generate some HTTP traffic um, on one of these machines uh, just to make sure the SMB relay attack happens. So we're doing that here. 
And notice there that you see a lot of activity from the SMB relay terminal, and that, that's why that's because it's the, the attack's actually executing. And now we just wait for the reverse shell. There's a 45 second delay on the on the on the payload, uh, so I just have to. I'm going to kind of skip a little bit, but I want to see you guys. I want you guys to see the payload connecting. There it is, that green text. That's our that's our initial payload. So now what the scenario that we have is that we have two. Um, two devices that are associated with our rogue access point attack, and we've used an SMB relay to uh, gain a shell on one. So now that we've pivoted into one of them, uh, we're going to use a persistent module uh, from Empire. Uh, for, for illustrator purposes, scheduled tasks works, works really nicely for this, although it's also really loud. It touches disk, so in a, in a real scenario, you'd want to use something that lives purely in memory. But I like scheduled tasks because it's like easy to explain uh, for, for doing like a talk. So. And, and you can see now we, we've executed the, the command host name and the command who am I. We have anti authority pr privileges on Jenkins up here in the top left. So we're going to execute the scheduled task. And we're going to set a timer for, for two minutes in the future. And you know, something really interesting happened when, when I was recording this. Um, I actually forgot to connect the, uh, attach the, U the, 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 the virtual interface that was attached to my, my USB Wi Fi adapter um, for, for, the, for the, the NIC that was connected to. Uh, the, the, the target network. Uh, so I was going to start clearing this and just like uh, start the recording over and over again. But something really interesting happened, and that's that when I um, uh, I actually had set 160 retries on that reverse shell uh, for some reason that I I don't know why I did that. But um, so when the second I reattached it, the reverse shell just suddenly appeared and suddenly worked. So I thought that was kind of cool. So I left it in there, and it kind of proves an interesting point about um, you know good implants is that they'll kind of doggedly try to you know get back to the attacker even if they don't can't immediately do so. But yeah, you're, we're going to fast forward a little bit, and you, you see here that we've executed the uh, the scheduled task, and I'm sure you don't want to sit here. You can see me wiggling my mouse because I was really bored waiting for this task to execute. Um, I'm not going to do that to you guys as well, so I'm going to try to loop through that as much as I can. All right. And at some point, this is when I realized that oh yeah, I didn't connect this thing. So I, I fixed the problem by attaching the network adapter. It's a very, very derp moment there. Um, and then I start getting ready to, to uh, start this recording all over again, right? So I start clearing the terminals. And then I go back to, um, to Empire here, and I start to go back to the main menu. And oh, wait, there's the reverse shell. All right, so now we've received the second reverse shell, this time on the target network. And we've now, we now can use this. Uh, we're going to interact with that 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 uh, agent that's now living on the target machine, and we've we've just pivoted into you know from one VLAN to the other. So that's an indirect wireless pivot, and the equivalent technique. I mean, it's actually like really straightforward. I mean, it's not very complicated. The equivalent technique in a wired network would be to unplug an unauthorized device from the wall and just connect it to a hostile network on which you can actually attack it, and you know. Um, and the reason you could do this is because port-based access controls, uh, they rely on the assumption that the physical layer can be trusted. In a wireless network, uh, WPA is the means through which the integrity of the physical layer is protected. So if you're using a weak form of WPA to EAP, uh, the attacker can actually freely control the physical layer using rogue access point attacks, and this renders port-based NAC, NAC mechanisms useless. So what this demonstrates is that port-based NAC mechanisms uh, do not effectively mitigate the risk presented by weak WPA2 EAP implementations. Um, furthermore, uh, it demonstrates that adding port-based NAC mechanisms to a wireless network it does not make the use of EAP TTLS or EAP PEEP any less in inappropriate if the network in question is used to grant access to sensitive information. And finally, um, uh, yeah, oh well, finally, okay. I guess there's another. I thought there's another slide there. Whatever. Okay, so um, yeah. So by the way, when we're talking about sensitive information. <laughs> It's Sunday. Um, when, when we talk about sensitive information, um, we're usually referring to PCI or HIPAA data. Uh, but you know, it's important to remember that compliance doesn't necessarily you know mean security. So I'm going to make a, like one last case for EAP TLS. Um, it, 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 it still is pretty painful, but it's not as bad as it used to be. Uh, you can use group policy to configure 802.1x clients, and that, I, I think that's pretty cool. I, I think your best option is to use a private CA. Um, you know, you can you can leverage Active Directory to deploy EAP TLS, and if you have a, a BYOD um, a process that you have to worry about uh, for that, you can just use a solid MDM solution, um, or or even just you know really streamline your BYOD onboarding solution uh, to make that work. You can even use Let's Encrypt to to deploy EAP TLS. Although to be honest, even the folks at Let's Encrypt say this is far from the best solution out there. As in, like you can technically do this, but 
Uh, so it's just some closing thoughts. Uh, just because you know wireless and wired, wired networks, they operate similarly at a logical level, and and that's that's by design. You you want you don't want to have to uh, fundamentally think about your networks differently depending on what what physical medium you're working with. Um, and that does not mean that they work the same way at the physical level. And you know um, we have to remember that when we're designing uh, security mechanisms that are designed to protect these things. And also as a community, uh, we should really question whether or not it's a sound business decision to neglect EAP TLS in favor of a more reactive approach that focuses on access control or threat containment. And you know, finally, um, if, if there's one thing to take away from this, is that the needs for convenience and security are often you know, at odds with one another. You know, be honest with yourselves. Maintain a healthy skepticism toward proposed solutions that promise both. And if you want to check out the attacks and try to implement them yourself, uh, relevant, the, the tool in question is github.com slash solstice slash and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.